With some curiosity that I welcome my next guest who managed to slash the crime rate in New York City and give back Times Square to families. He's cleaned up Philadelphia in the meantime and Miami as well. So what would he do for the town he was born in? I want you to welcome, please, the man who brought a zero tolerance. He's known as America's toughest cop. Will you welcome, please, Miami Chief of Police from the Liberties, Mr. John Timoney. Hi, John. How are you back? Good to see you. Good to see you. Please sit yourself you down. I reckon, uh, I mean, you were the one who... Uh, drew my attention to page three of the Irish Times this morning yeah. where they had a catalogue of the, all the killings so yeah. far this year. It must make you sad to reflect on your native city and what it's yeah. become. No, growing up in Dublin in, in the 50s, I left in 1961. It was a you know, small town, uh, murders maybe once every six months or so for the, for the whole country. Yeah. And now it's uh, between England and Ireland, there's this new wave of violence in the last, in the last decade. It's kind of shocking for, for these cultures. Yeah. Um, I mentioned New York, yeah. which is where, if you like, you, you uh, made your public name. You're yeah. already well recognized within the, the, the force yeah. as a, a top cop. Uh, how bad was crime in New York City at that stage? Oh, in New York City uh, in 1990 uh, was the all-time record for crime uh, in any city in America. And you really had the feeling that things were out of control, that New York City was going to go down the tubes, uh, you know, never to resurrect itself again. And so in 1994, uh, Bill Bratton became the police chief, the police commissioner. Now that's a, a kind of an elective office. It's not a, a you come through the ranks. This, you were, no, you were that's the, an appointed, I come through the ranks. Yeah, he was you're the top position. cop. I was the top, the four-star chief. Yeah. And so he and I and, and some other folks uh, with Mayor Rudy Giuliani began a dramatic, drastic turnaround of New York City, going after not just the, the serious violent crime, but also the, the so-called quality of life, the low-level drug dealing, uh, public drinking, uh, graffiti, a whole host of things that when you see a city uh, that, that's run that way or that appears that way, it gives it a sense of lawlessness that nobody's in control, nobody cares. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a scene where, where really serious crime flourishes. Was it really zero tolerance? It was zero tolerance as, as we understood it, but uh, when the term zero tolerance made its appearance, uh, here in England and Ireland, it really was taken, as I told the Brits, they took it way too literal, but I guess it's their language and they can take it any way they want. <laughs> in America, there was, it was more nuanced. The understanding of zero tolerance was that, you know, we had turned a blind eye in certain areas of New York City to low-level drug dealing. Well, it's a poor neighborhood. What's the difference? Uh, and so it was zero tolerance in, in that sense that not only was, was crime or drugs would be tolerated in the nicer areas of New York City, but even in the poor areas, just because you were poor and downtrodden didn't mean you didn't deserve a good quality of life. So basically you were saying, you wouldn't do this on Park Avenue, you're not doing it here. Exactly, exactly. That was the, that was the line. That's correct. Um, how effective was it? When did you start to see results? We saw results immediately. The, the, the first year, homicides were down uh, about 18%. Overall crime was down 14%. And that continued and continues through today, so that the crime rate in New York City is equivalent to what it was when I first went to New York City in 1961. All those years ago. Yeah. I remember before yeah. your, your uh, reign at Times Square, it was yeah. a sleazy place. Yeah, Peep I, was, shows. I was the captain of that area. Really? Yeah, it was really bad. And, and yet you hadn't got the power to change policies about that area at exactly. that time. Exactly. There there they really weren't serious about dealing with it. Uh, they were serious about dealing with other things like police corruption and a whole host of, of other uh, issues. And so I had always said, boy, if I get to the top, well, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so you did get to the I top and to you, the top. you cleaned up Times yeah. Square. And how would you deal with something like underage drinking? I mean, a lot of kids, I mean, yeah, they're going sure. to experiment, they're going to get a few right. cans, they're not going to know how strong drink is, they're going to get drunk, they're right. going to get messy, sloppy. Yes. How did you deal with that? The, we, we had issues in certain parts of the city, uh, particularly in Greenwich Village, which was a bit of a tourist attraction. You, you would think of Grafton Street and places like that, where kids came in from the suburbs. Now, these were middle class kids. They'd come in, they'd start drinking uh, seven or eight o'clock at night. By 10 or 11, they were engaged in, in fist fights, breaking windows, uh, attacking, and there's a huge gay population, attacking the gays, robbing people. Uh, we, we began to address that by dealing with it early on. If you were caught out in public with a, with a can of beer in the open, that was confiscated, you were given a summons to appear in court. So you don't so wait for trouble. It, you don't wait for it, because it's going to happen. 
And so you can deal with it later on when it gets out of control, and then that means arrests, incarceration, or you can deal with it early on by summonses, by intervention, and it works. Okay, you remember St. Patrick's Day in Dublin. Oh, you, yeah. There wasn't a drink to be had except at the dog show. That's right. Um, and you, your it was parents, a religious holiday. Exactly, yeah. but your parents would bring you to the parade or yes, whatever, exactly. and you felt safe on the streets. Yeah. Now, by 7 o'clock or even earlier in the day, people yeah. feel terrorised. It's sloppy, it's messy, the streets yeah. are covered in vomit, there are aggressive people yeah. out there. How would you handle that? How would well, you give it back to the people who want it? That's not unlike New York City going into the, into the early 80s. Uh, the St. Patrick's Day parade was completely uh, out of control. It was also embarrassing to be an Irishman and witness these 13 and 14 year old kids passed out on the steps of the Museum of Modern Art at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so we, we, we made a commitment to, again, start early, intercept these kids as they're getting off the subways. If we saw them with beer, you confiscate the beer. But by the way, in defense of the Irish, it wasn't just the Irish. The sure. West Indian Day Parade had also been out of control. And again, almost all of it revolved around drinking. And so what you do early on is, is confiscate the booze, issue the summonses, and really prevent it yeah. from getting out of hand. Because it is against the law here to drink on the streets. Yeah, of course, so, yeah, yeah. So that's what you do, get in Yeah, and there's a tendency to say, ah, oh, what's, what's the big deal? And there really isn't, for some person having a can of beer, it isn't the big deal. But we know there are certain parts of any city, uh, particularly the tourist parts, or where, where the bars are and the clubs, where kids come in, and within two or three hours, all hell breaks loose. It's different for a New York cop, though. He's packing a shooter. So he says, give me the beer, give me your name, give yeah. me your address, and the guys comply. Yeah. You know, you come to a gang of Dublin gougers or Cork yeah. gougers who uh, are full of beer yeah. and the unarmed cop, perhaps a, a female even, says, give me your drink, yeah. give me your names, and you know what kind of two-letter reply or two-word reply they're going to get? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's always a difficult, difficult situation, but, but the way you deal with that, for example, it's, it's not unlike there are certain drug areas uh, in New York City and other American cities that are dangerous whether you have a gun or not. And so the way you deal with that, or, or in this case the public drinking, is with a team. So you have a sergeant, and not just one police officer, but three or four police officers going in with, with a show of force, not aggressive force, but going in there, letting them know, uh, you know we mean business. And so there's four or five police officers confronting one or two drunks. They kind of get the message.